Okay, so wow, what a big crowd. And thank you so much for coming. I'm shocked to see how many people here on a beautiful day. Um, and uh, uh, so I am going to start the, start the ball rolling. And I entitled my uh, talk, my part of the talk, Thinking Critically About Mixed Methods, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And um, one feels kind of vulnerable when one gets up here to talk about mixed methods, particularly um, at CQ, as we know that there's a lot of passion around the topic and a lot of differing opinions. And um, as Paula um, Gardner and I often uh, chat about, looking at, there's Paula back there, um, we always talk about who's going to get voted off the CQ island first. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure after today, I may get voted off the island. But anyway. Um, uh, Maybe this will be my swan song, song, but hopefully not. Um, and um, um, so without further ado, I will plunge in. And my comments will be uh, much more um, general. Uh, our our uh, speakers have some wonderful empirical work to share with you. I'm going to keep it much more high level as an introductory commentary. But I'm happy to share with you some of our experiences at St. Mike's doing um, mixed methods uh, projects um, as part of the panel discussion. So I think it's really important um, as qualitative researchers and as mixed methods researchers to put ourselves in the picture. And I think reflexivity is one of the cornerstones of strength in research of all kinds. I think uh, quantitative researchers may not be as comfortable or as familiar with the idea of reflexivity, but I think it behooves us actually all to think about what does it mean to do research, whatever paradigm we come from. Um, and what, and that research, scientific research, is a social construction. So I think it's really important for all of us, quantitative, qualitative, uh, mixed methods people, um, uh, that we should um, think carefully about where we come from. So I come to mixed methods from a particular standpoint. Um, it's situated conduct. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself further than a, a, lot, a bit more elaborating what um, Laurie uh, mentioned in her very kind introduction. So I started out my academic life uh, way back before I became a physiotherapist, studying cultural and social, social and cultural anthropology. And then I moved on and became a physiotherapist. I worked for many years in clinical practice. My interest in research stemmed from my clinical work. And I went off and did a master's in epidemiology. And I did statistics courses. And then I worked for quite a while actually doing quantitative research before I had the opportunity to go back and do a, a PhD where I came home to my what I feel was my methodological home which was qualitative and it was a narrative based study for my for my PhD but in those in between years between my master's and my PhD I spent time uh, looking at logistic regression, linear regression, survival analysis and the like and so I'm a little bit unusual in some of the from for, from the standpoint of some qualitative researchers, and that I, do, I have done quantitative interpretation as well as qualitative interpretation. I then went on and did a postdoc at St. Mike's, and that's, what, that's how I came to St. Mike's was during my postdoctoral work, where I was actually doing critical qualitative work to develop film-based and arts-based methods, um, but I also had the opportunity to work on, in a multidisciplinary team on some group projects where we were looking at neighborhoods and health and the built environment and the social environment and the role in their role in mental well-being. And I had an opportunity to start to problematize the idea of observation and how observation and standardized tools of observation are used in neighborhoods and health literature. And um, that was um, an opportunity to contribute and to help other people who are quantitative to think about observation differently and to bring a qualitative lens to that topic. So I just wanted to give you an idea of where I come from, and this informs what, what I'm going to say to you today about paradigm. But um, So it means that I've gone back and forth, um, and now that I'm at the Applied Health Research Center, we work with a lot of different uh, researchers. So I'm very fortunate um, to work with a great team of uh, critical qualitative researchers who either are PhD prepared or are working on their PhDs. And we have the opportunity to work with uh, researchers from a broad range of disciplines. And so we've been drawn into mixed methods research. And um, as a result, um, we feel like we have a, we're developing a, quite a bit of experience in this area. Um, so 
What's in a name? Um, so what, what is this thing called mixed methods? And what do we actually mean when we say that we're engaging in mixed methods? Um, I remember when I, I went to um, the, the conference that some of you may have been to in Urbana, uh, where um, I heard a wonderful talk some years ago by Elliot Eisner, and it was a, it was a uh, symposium on mixed methods. And uh, he said, well, you can mix drinks, but don't mix methods. And so I've, I've always carried that with me. Should you? Shouldn't you? Um, will it give you a hangover if you do it? Um, and, 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 and what sort of paradigmatic hangovers do we need to attend to? Um, and what might be the antidote? Um, uh, so um, uh, ultimately, it does come down to a question of paradigm. There's a lot of proceduralist discussion as well that I think we need to attend to about what comes first when we assume that qualitative or quantitative data sets, uh, where those will get us and what different, the use of different paradigms will get us in terms of scholarly output. Um, and it, often in many clinical circles, there's a real silence on the question of paradigm, clinical, med medical clinical research. There's a silence around paradigm. It's kind of sort of a, not a dirty little secret, but sort of the kind of thing that, that people sometimes are not very comfortable with, particularly quantitative folks who might not have had to do a deep dive thinking about paradigm. Um, and so we need to, I think we need to attend to it. We need to attend to issues of coherence and whether data sources that we are using are actually informing one another, whether they speak to one another, and whether, whether they just exist alongside one another, or whether they're just living in parallel, parallel universes. So ultimately, I think it comes down to a matter of perspective. And I should uh, thank my husband, who's an amateur photographer, for these pictures. Um, because I think paradigm shapes how we see the world. And I'm a visual researcher, and I, I like juxtaposing things. So we might think that the photo on the left is very much about the fine-grained, lived experience, minutiae of, uh, of, of life that qualitative researchers are particularly good at in terms of uh, situation, uh, detail, um, uh, up close and personal um, is one way to think about it. Whereas some people might say, well, quantitative allows us to get the big picture. That 30,000 foot view um, is sometimes the way it's framed. However, I would argue that actually we live, both paradigms live in both places. Because you can imagine quantitative researchers sometimes deal with the so-called building blocks of life, very, very important, detailed, fine-grained kinds of research. But qualitative researchers are often looking at social structural forces. We're looking at uh, political, economic, social context, um, and much more upstream things that may be actually shaping how people live and uh, experience healthcare, for example, in the kind of context that I work in. Um, So why should we care about paradigms? Well, I think we need to care about paradigms for a number of reasons. One is if we're going to do research, we need methodological co coherence. So when we mix our paradigms, we need to understand sort of what, how do we develop a coherent picture of our data and our interpretation of that data. We also need to attend to theory and have theoretical coherence because this has implications for interpretation and what we understand from our data, data sets and our data sources. And it also has, it's about positioning the researcher. We need to both, as in both sets of ways of thinking about the world, we need to know how we're positioning the researcher. Because the researcher, although we often, many people often think that quantitative researchers do not influence the data that they collect or the questions that they ask, in actual fact, they do. And I think good quantitative researchers acknowledge that, or, or strong quantitative researchers often acknowledge that. So in terms of mixed methods, I think it's important as we, as we embark on this, uh, this uh, talk to distinguish between methods and methodologies. So when we talk about method, so when we look at some of the data, the, the literature on paradigmatic uh, conflict and, mix, and mix, me, mixing methods, that um, method, it, when we think about method, we're talking about procedures, techniques, approaches to gather, store, analyze and pre present research information. Whereas methodology, technically, is the study of methods. Methods informed by worldviews. 
that are theoretically informed and theoretically robust and have certain underlying assumptions about them, and those underlying assumptions need to be accounted for. Wiggins, in um, their 2009 paper, uh, talked, said, commented, methods are guided by methodologies, which in turn are guided by the basic fundamental assumptions of a worldview. Um, and you can focus on methods and differences of where you're getting your data. So you could have data sources from surveys and interviews, but you could still be monomethodological, for example, and you could have an overarching paradigm that informs, paradigmatic view that informs your research. So I said I was going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So let's move on to that. Um, so we, um, when I say the good, it's about the promise of, uh, of qualitative methods. So what does good look like? Well, these are this is when methods or methods, or I should comment that methods or techniques need not be a theoretically applied. So for example, I'm hoping that I don't have to restart, but anyway. Um, is there anything I need to do? Or? <laughs> um, Good time. No, it's just a notification. So when we think of methods or techniques, um, if we think of Bourdieu and other researchers who talk about the Im imaginative empirical sociology, Bourdieu argued that um, that it's not solely about the that quantitative and qualitative data are not incommensurable, but that you have you can be strong theoretically informed, um, the 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 theoretically informed and develop new theory using multiple data sources. So he was not um, particularly sort of um, uh, concerned about whether you were using qualitative or quantitative methods. Silva comments that we can tell stories of the social in all their richness and complexity using multiple, uh, multiple sources of data. But it entails good, good mixed methods research, entails a sophisticated analysis whereby silences, contradictions, and incongruencies become opportunities for analysis. And I think that in that way we can trouble triangulation as is usually framed in post-positivist circles where we think that one has to confirm the other. I think we can actually find a lot of uh, analytic insights when things are contradictory. Relatively few projects, however, fulfill the, fulfill the promise. Fortunately, we have two very uh, talented um, mixed methods researchers who are going to, who, who do do strong paradigmatically um, robust research, and we're going to hear about that in just a couple of minutes. But unfortunately, um, relatively few people do this well, and I think there's a lot of social structural reasons why this is not done well. Um, uh, and I'm going to move on to that in a minute, that minute. But those that do, the best, I think the best mixed methods research is aims for paradigmatic coherence that extends beyond the spe specific techniques employed. Well, what's bad? Well, I actually want us to talk more about challenge, and then I'm going to talk about the ugly. But, um, I, but the bad, or, or what, why it's hard to do robust mixed methods research really well, um, and, that it's, and to appreciate the nuances and elegance of each method. Often, um, when, we, when we think of, uh, when we have graduate students, for example, I caution them that they might not want to take this on because they have to really understand both paradigms well. Otherwise, you end up with a very superficial treatment in terms of theory and methodology, and, or you end up with methodological uh, incoherence, oversimplification, and proceduralism. And here I want to take a little bit of issue with Cresswell, who kind of sort of parcels it out into, uh, into various types of um, mixed methods research, but I think it's much more um, nuanced and complex than he actually portrays it. Um, there's a number of social structural constraints on researchers conducting mixed methods research, specifically, for example, in publication, just as an example. If we think about, there's not very many good examples in the literature of really strong mixed methods research where they both come together, and that's partly because of the pressures that we as scholars are under. If we have two different sources of data and we're working as part of a team, we may be pressured to or encouraged to publish two papers, one that's quantitative, one that's qualitative. And that's 
Always better, isn't it? You have two papers instead of one. But it means that we miss that opportunity to bring those two together, to interrogate our data, to, in to see what each data set says to one another. Um, and so I've been on, on uh, projects where I really, really argued for saying, I know that we're talking about word limits and clinical journals that only take so much. And then when you're trying to combine those, it's very, very hard to find a home for your work. And sometimes I'm successful in making the argument, and sometimes I'm not. I'm not. But more, more often than not, than not, I'm not successful in being able to bring those um, two data sets together in a, in a single paper. <laughs> this is also true in terms of grants and career demands, that the idea that we need to um, collaborate with somebody who may be more senior, for example. We may, to, may need to um, sell our work in the grant because they'll say we're more credible if we add um, some numbers, for example. Um, there's, a, there's a host of other reasons as well. But in terms of tenure and appointment, this is where all of that kind of thing starts to uh, link together, which is that um, uh, w when we're encouraged to publish more, get this pr a particular kind of grant, um, uh, that those kinds of things start to push us down a path of keeping the two separate. Um, and then I think it also has to do with editorial issues um, and review issues as well, both in terms of grants and publications. So well, when is it ugly or just a big steaming mess? Um, so I think these are a few instances um, of, of arguments that are made that end up pushing people to do not good work. Um, the idea that more methods must somehow be better, that if you, if you get a good, just did a survey as well as that set of interviews, that it's going to be a stronger, stronger study. Um, there's an inattention, when there's an inattention to paradigms, coherence, rationale, and relationship between various methods and techniques. Um, when there's poor grounding in epistemological and ontological concerns. Um, and uh, when we have inexperienced researchers or inexperienced thesis committees who aren't sure how to navigate this paradigmatic divide. Um, often you'll hear, if I add a qualitative piece, it will make it patient-centered. I hear that a lot from my quantitative colleagues. Um, if I add numbers, it will make me credible, is what I hear from qualitative co colleagues. Um, and you know, just to say sample size isn't everything either, um, you know, that more numbers um, in terms of great, greater number of participants is somehow better. Um, and uh, also poor articulation of research question and purpose and what you really are about and how you bring those two, those two together as opposed to having two different questions and two different data sets and never bringing it together into a coherent whole. So how do we move forward? Well. We've got two great speakers to talk to us about how to move forward um, and who've done really, really interesting and robust work. But um, I just wanted to um, let you know also about something that I'm working on at the moment, um, which is a, a shirt grant um, with a team of researchers, uh, two fellow CQ fellows, uh, Jay Shaw and Barb Gibson, and biostatisticians Kevin Thorpe and Ashley Cullen, Ross Upshur and philosophy, philosophy professor Maya Goldenberg from the University of Guelph, Carolyn Ziegler, who's an information specialist, and graduate students, PhD students, Natalie Baker and Clara Juan Du Prats. Um, we as a team are uh, engaged in this project with, whose aim is to understand a history of the present paradigmatic divide, why it has been constituted in this way, and its implications for research practice. We are looking at a history of the present over the last 30 years and doing a knowledge synthesis, and then we're going to do empirical work. And what we want to do is because we think that the burden of interpretation is actually carried by both qualitative researchers and quantitative researchers, but it's not usually articulated in quantitative, in quantitative circles. However, robust, theoretically informed quantitative research also entails interpretation, nuance, assumptions, theory, and um, we want to talk to, we're going to do an empirical piece where we interview qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods researchers about what it means to do interpretation and analysis. So that is sort of, stay tuned, um, and, and uh, that's what I'm working on at the moment. Um, and now I think, just my acknowledgments, I have some references, and I'm going to let 
my colleagues take it away. Well, first, let me thank uh, Lori Ross and um, CQ for the invitation to be part of this panel. I'd also like to echo how wonderful it is to see so many people um, out here today on such a, such a beautiful day. So most of the research that I do uh, with gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men uh, involves interdisciplinary teams and the collection of both quantitative and qualitative data. Now, the participation of gay men and other men who have sex with men as participants is key to the success of HIV and STI research and enhanced prevention efforts. However, little published research has explicitly explored the self-described impacts of study participation in HIV and sexual health research. For example, Holt reflects that aside from research on how the experience of participating in surveys impacts likely, likely future participation in surveys, current sp scholarship is, quote, remarkably quiet about the potential for questionnaires to affect participants' attitudes or behavior. Drawing on experiences from managing uh, quantitative surveillance technologies, Holt theorizes that there are unintentional effects on gay men who participate in quantitative behavioral HIV surveillance through the Gay Community Periodic Survey, or GCPS, in Australia, noting the need for empirical research in this field and questioning how quantitative survey instruments may alter how participants think and feel about their behavior. This is, of course, different from uh, research evaluating specific HIV interventions that aim to specifically alter feelings, uh, alter experiences. Um, for example, intervention research trying to lessen social isolation or uh, research trying to alter sexual practices. Here, I'm talking about a context of research where there's impacts beyond what we actually are intending to do. Today I'll draw upon rich narratives uh, of HIV negative study participants who lived in Vancouver, BC to elucidate some of the self-described complex emotional and behavioral impacts of participation in the production of qualitative and quantitative research. Uh, I also must admit it was a bit of a challenge to decide what to um, present here given the critical scholars. I just recently joined the island, so like, <laughs> give me a pass. <laughs> and, uh, maybe not. I guess there's no passes here. But I just recently joined the island, so um, don't vote me off CQ just yet. <laughs> I, and I, I really hope that in providing uh, some of these focused reflections on this underexplored area, I might spark some themes for discussion that complement uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, and my re main kind of reason for presenting this work is that while I think it's really highly important to reflect on the tensions among researchers doing mixed methods research, uh, you know, as we consider bridging epistemic divides, doing this kind of work in a neoliberal context, uh, maybe addressing the paradigmatic hangovers Janet referenced, obviously that's really important. But I think it's also worth considering how, how does the participation in the research in enterprise actually impact upon those who participate in our research. So I'm drawing primarily from a paper that was just recently published uh, in AIDS Care, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this paper, as well as our community partner, uh, the Health Initiative for Men. Now, we conducted a mixed methods, mixed methods research um, study with a cohort of HIV-negative gay men uh, to complement research with gay men uh, recently diagnosed with an acute or recent infection. Um, this was a CIHR-funded five-year study. And so for more information about this study uh, and our other outputs, you can see our study website, acutehivstudy.com, as well as the work of our community partner. Um, this is the least sexually charged image from our uh, community partners campaign. So this was a study, and I, I reference this both to highlight the work of our community partner, but also to give some kind of context for this research, a study, a mixed method program of research funded around um, the, the kind of heightened risk around acute HIV transmission, uh, this idea that HIV is hottest at the start or most infectious at the start. And this is what this uh, campaign uh, underscored. So the purpose of our HIV negative study was to recruit gay men who had received an HIV uh, 
test result or a point of care HIV test or pooled nucleotic acid amplification test and better understand their testing knowledge and behaviors as well as their sexual and substance use patterns. We used with qualitative and quantitative data um, to explore related questions regarding the sexual, mental, physical, and social health of our participants. And in addition to these domains, we identify the importance of asking interview questions regarding how the research was experienced from the participant's standpoint. So be between June 2011 and January 2012, we recruited recently um, tested HIV negative, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men at Health Initiative for Men's uh, Downstown Davy uh, Street Clinic in Vancouver. 166 uh, participants completed the quantitative component at baseline, and a subset of 32 research participants completed in-depth qualitative interviews. And these are the participants I'm drawing upon today who completed both these quantitative and qualitative aspects of the study. All uh, qualitative participants had at least one instance of condomless anal sex in their last five sexual encounters. And all interviewers had experience working in Vancouver community-based organizations that focused on LBGTQ health. Interviews were independently coded to identify emergent themes and interpret the data through an iterative process following grounded theory. Now, um, this, is, this slide's a bit of a tease, but I wanted to kind of say that I, I position our research as a complex work process coordinated by texts, research instruments, reports, journal articles, across the life cycle uh, of research activities. So this is just kind of an illustration of, of some kind of similar data collection uh, methods you would have seen. And while it's somewhat beyond the scope of what I'm presenting today, in other work I draw on the field of institutional ethnography to help conceptualize the research enterprise as a system of ruling relations coordinated by texts translocally. In the most kind of basic institutional ethnographic sense, mixed methods research is a work process in which texts coordinate both participants and the work of researchers. So I was just actually reviewing this sexual networking grid at the bottom here. I'm not sure if people have ever used this in research. I, I had this idea for like passing around a sexual networking grid and people could interview each other, but we would kind of delve into something that was far more intimate than maybe what we wanted to get into right now. But one of the things I'm kind of referencing here is that we ask incredibly detailed, sensitive information of research participants, and in this case, repeatedly over time, uh, and what does that mean in terms of coordinating how uh, participants think about their sex lives and sexuality? So most participants lived in Vancouver at the time of study enrollment. However, a majority had moved to Vancouver within five years. Over 90% identified as gay. Participants were predominantly white. Uh, most had full-time employment and had completed college or university. Uh, participants' relationship status was uh, split between those either dating, partnered, or married. Just uh, over half were under 30. Um, and there was kind of quite some uh, diversity along the income gradient. So I'm going to uh, focus today on four related impacts of study involvement articulated by our mixed method study participants, placing kind of real emphasis on this fourth domain. So participants expressed their interest in contributing to research projects that would benefit their communities. Um, men discussed pride in participation, a sentiment they said they shared within their social networks. Uh, so for example, many participants talked about um, the, the, this kind of feeling of being really glad to have engaged in this type of um, this type of research, and this was kind of their quote community involvement or community participation. So here, as Jeffrey noted, study participation was a relatively quote low key easy way of contributing to the community. I'm not at Meals on Wheels. I'm not at AIDS Vancouver. I'm not giving out condoms at the Pride Parade, but I commit to a year or two or four of a study. For some men, the study was said to have opened up ideas for other ways of contributing to the gay community beyond the end of data collection, including uh, volunteering with gay men's health organizations. Participants also discussed the overall impacts of study participation on their HIV and STI testing information and practices. Uh, so for example, men cited a variety of reasons as to why their testing behaviors did or didn't change. Uh, for some participants, engagement in public health research was said to have resulted in an increase in HIV and STI testing and knowledge of risks and related to HIV transmission. 
Some participants also linked their increase in testing to specific components of study participation, including learning more about testing, having scheduled commitments at the clinic for research activities, and reporting the study helped to normalize testing. So here, for example, Brock said, I, I don't feel freaked out to like go and get tested. Oh, oh sorry, thank you. Um, I don't feel like freaked out. Um, I'm freaked out now, though. OK. I don't, <laughs> I don't feel like freaked out to knowing how to get tested. I feel like it's more of a thought pattern in my mind, like you know I should get tested soon, whereas it wasn't necessarily before. So the main kind of two impacts that I was interested in highlighting today, though, here are this third and fourth. So participants noted a variety of changes in regards to their uh, sexual behaviors, some of which were said to directly be a result of study uh, participation and others that were attributed to other factors. So most participants noted that some aspect of their thinking about sexual activity and or HIV knowledge was impacted by study participation, even in the absence of identified behavior change. For many participants, various components of the study were articulated as a unique component and a unique opportunity for reflexivity and increased self-awareness about their sexual behaviors. So here, for example, we can see uh, Dylan's reflections on the impacts of saying things out loud to his interviewer. Oh yeah, I guess I know I'm having more unprotected anal sex if I'm on coke, you know. A minority of participants recounted feelings of shame, guilt, and worry as a result of detailing their sexual behaviors within quantitative surveys and or qualitative interviews over the year. So for example, when he quote, filled up a networking grid with five recent partners, Ben here described that it quote, made him feel like a whore basically. Some participants told us also that various aspects of the research gave them an opportunity to spend time thinking about their sexuality and, and their lives in ways they had not previously done. This theme was particularly pronounced when discussing the impact of the qualitative interviews. Many participants drew a parallel between participating in qualitative interviewing and receiving counseling or therapy. We can see this well exemplified in Eric's quote where he makes this connection and notes how he will miss these sessions. A few participants drew a distinction between the qualitative interviews and prior experiences of counseling. For example, Martin recounted very negative formative counseling experiences when coming out as gay and resulting difficulty in trusting medical professionals. However, when he was reflecting on this component of the mixed method study, the qualitative interviews, he said it's, I don't know, in a way, it's almost therapeutic, right, the qualitative interviews, because it's almost like that session that I never had when it's like, tell me about your father. Yeah, I don't know. At first, I think it took me a while to actually start talking, but you're a good listener, and it's actually, yeah, it's easy to tell you that stuff. Related to Martin's reflections, other participants who were currently receiving counseling explained that the type of information that they shared with their interviewer was something that they usually only disclosed in the context of formal counseling. For some men, experiencing the research in this way was said to be a real surprise. So for example, Sam talked about how much he enjoyed the qualitative interviews and said, quote, it's been, it's been good, yeah, in a way you, I've been kind of tricked into doing counseling sessions with you because I do need a counselor. Finally, some participants said that they appreciated the qualitative interviews as a space to speak about things they were unable to talk about with other people in their lives. For example, Anthony explained, I'm sorry if I veered off in a few different tangents, but again, one, being out of, uh, out in a city outside of uh, Vancouver, I can't really discuss this with my mother and I don't have a lot of friends who, are, who talk about these sort of things. Whether participation in national gay men sexual health surveys such as Sex Now or GCPS in Australia, or involvement in smaller qualitative or mixed method studies, advancing research with and for communities of gay men is reliant on their interest in and commitment to participation. Through a novel analysis of participant narratives, we've used rich accounts of the self-described interrelated aspects of study participation to reveal the ways in which the methods of quantitative and qualitative public health data collection may produce unintentional and unexpected effects for participants. In this study, research participation was expressed as something that gave men a source of pride while being a relatively easy form of civic engagement. 
Some men said that they saw participation in research as their mode of contributing to the health of the gay community and made them aware of opportunities for sustained engagement in activities related to gay men's health. Now, one of the most pronounced themes I've highlighted today in the qualitative data was the extent to which participants discussed the in-depth interviews as a form of counseling or therapy. Men talked about this as a generally positive aspect of the qualitative interviews and discussed how their interviewers made them feel comfortable as they built rapport over the course of the study. However, of course, this demands our own more reflexive critical engagement. In some cases, in reflecting on the qualitative interviews as a counseling experience, participants explicitly noted that their past and or current need for counseling was unmet. The longitudinal character of these interviews, coupled with repeated interaction with the interviewer to complete quantitative study components, may have further facilitated feelings of comfort and trust. If you kind of think back to that slide I threw out at the beginning, we had multiple interactions for qualitative recruitment, multiple uh, surveys for uh, sexual networking grids, for uh, surveys, lots of follow-up to make sure there was retention in the study. So a really building of rapport over time. Some participants noted that they were surprised how similar the interview sessions felt to counseling and that they opened, up, they opened up in ways that they had not anticipated. This finding supports the work of Risotto, who argues that the process of qualitative interviews, which can involve achieving catharsis through the telling of one's story, must be recognized for having therapeutic value. This, of course, raises important ethical concerns related to the researcher-participant relationship, the establishment of boundaries, and the training of research interviewers. While participation in research may have therapeutic value in some cases, it's important to explicitly underscore that participation in this or similar public health research should not be a substitute for formal counseling, therapy, and men other mental health support services. This analysis is subject to multiple limitations, including the potential role of social desirability in these narrative accounts. We must also kind of critically reflect on what these interviews actually provide us entry to, um, a kind of a complex uh, theoretical and methodological discussion um, that is much debated in forums such as this. Beyond formal counseling and therapy, participants' reflections also underscore that gay men have differential social supports in their lives and that many may not have networks of people uh, with whom they can discuss matters of importance. As such, men's narratives reveal the need for not only formal counseling services, but also the significance of other opportunities for peer group support, mental health support, and more informal spaces where gay men can build community networks of support. Men discussed the extent to which the study impacted their sexual behaviors and their thinking about their sex lives more generally. For many participants, the study was described as this kind of reflexive opportunity, although I say reflexive, nobody uses the word reflexive. <laughs> well, some people do, we do. Um, but they were describing this kind of opportunity to reflect on their lives, which they didn't have. Um, while most participants did not describe explicit changes in their sexual behaviors, some noted that participation led them to reconsider their sexual behaviors, and at times, led them to think that they had too many sexual partners. And this was specifically uh, salient when they were describing this recounting over and over again in filling out these sexual networking grids. This finding again links to the theoretical work of Holt, who builds on hacking to question, quote, the reciprocal relationship between classificatory practices, such as surveillance, and the people that are classified within them. People can reflect on and respond to their classification, changing their practices. As such, it's important to that in this kind of research, we note that research is an intervention in and of itself, and the ways in which data are collected may lead some participants to question and potentially alter their sexual behaviors and or how they think about themselves and their sexuality. In closing, while it was only expressed by a minority of participants, it's also worth underscoring how the varied forms of research and HIV surveillance with gay men can have unintended consequences, including the production and reinforcement of feelings of shame, guilt, and worry as participants imagine their own practices and that of others within their community. 
This is an important factor to consider in sexual health research and points to where counseling, life skills, and other peer support programs may offer important opportunities for sex positive support for gay men. And academic research such as this are simply not equipped to provide this. Our analysis highlights the importance of researchers being reflective regarding how their research and study designs may have differential positive and or negative unintended consequences. More research, I always hate ending with more research is needed, but I do think this is an area where more research is needed to understand the extent to which involvement in HIV and STI research has longer term impacts on participants, including their involvement uh, with community organizations, future research studies, and positive or negative feelings about sex or sexuality that were elicited through the research process. And as I wrap up, I just wanted to highlight uh, two publications from our complementary work with HIV positive gay men. Uh, I'm doing this primarily to note that the majority of our pub publications from this uh, work were either qualitatively focused, like this one below, or quantitatively focused, like this one above, which I think kind of just underscores further the point that, that um, Janet was, was making. And it's something that I've been thinking a lot about as I participate in large teams of uh, of researchers who are primarily epidemiologically or quantitatively focused with kind of scant qualitative research uh, capacity. Um, so I would say that I am certainly guilty of reproducing the same in terms of a division of labor while, um, while saying that there are mixed-ish elements of these kinds of um, study components. So as I continue to work on doing large-scale mixed methods research with diverse uh, provincial and national research teams, I'm, I'm increasingly reflexive regarding the kinds of products produced through our research and, what mo and, and kind of recognizing this tension in terms of what what's, is being produced. And of course, this raises many questions concerning the extent to which mixed methods research or much, much mixed methods research in the health sciences is actually mixed at all. This this is just kind of one of many questions that I think might be, might be worth probing further, um, especially in light for the call for critical mixed methods research that Laurie opened the panel with. I hope that these kinds of uh, general reflections based on this data might be of interest and value, not only for mixed methods research participants, uh, but also any of us interested in how either our qualitative, quantitative, or mixed method studies might have unintentional impacts of those that we conduct research with. And so uh, I'd just like to end by thanking all the research participants, uh, CIHR, our community partner, Health Initiative for Men, uh, and my collaborators on this paper. So thanks very much. Um, I want to start just by thanking Lori uh, for inviting me and Andrea for coordinating everything. Um, I am going to spend, I guess, the next 20 minutes um, focusing on the practices of integration in mixed methods research. And I'm going to do that by talking about um, a five-year um, project that I've worked on looking at access to home care services for LGBTQ communities in Ontario. Um, I suppose in some ways a, a question that's guiding the presentation is whether using mixed methods with a particular focus on integration um, can enhance the transformative uh, potential of, of a research project or more accurately a research team, I suppose. Uh, it's not the project that does the work, it's the people, right? Um, and I'm going to do this by speaking to levels of integration and approaches uh, to integration. And in keeping with Janet's uh, presentation, there may be the good, the bad, and the mm -hmm. ugly here. Uh, I'll let you decide. I'm not yet on the island, um, so mm -hmm. I guess you can't kick me off. But you may not let me on, I don't know. So. Um, I just want to start by uh, acknowledging the many people that worked on the project over many hours, days, weeks, months, and years. I co-led the project with Judy McDonnell at the School of Social Work at York University and worked with some academic uh, researchers, community partners, um, two advisory committees, and a number of graduate and research assistants, Elisa, who's here. So thanks for your work. 
So, um, so from its proposal stage, the project incorporated a sex and gender-based analysis to examine sexual orientation and gender identity as they are implicated in the ways that relations of care are structured and experienced by home care receiving LGBTQ people. However, the research was premised on our understanding that the intersecting identities of diversely situated LGBTQ community members and the impacts of interlocking systems of oppression operate within the context of the healthcare system as in all social institutions. And these inter intersections operate to produce different access and equity home care experiences within and across LGBTQ communities. So while a sex and gender-based analysis vis-a-vis -vis the project's focus on sexual orientation and gender identity are central to the research questions and analysis, we more accurately worked through the critical theoretical lens of intersectionality to explore complex dynamics shaping the home care experiences of sexual and gender minority people. And in doing this, we used an intracategorical uh, conceptualization of intersectionality so we were relying on uh, existing boundaries of sexual and gender identity categories, but also complicating them and using them in a more critical way in the project. From the beginning, we noted uh, a persistent pattern of exclusion and, and inattention to LGBT communities in the home care literature. There is a body of literature in home care that looks really more at cultural competency. And although this is a limited uh, framework, for thinking about access and equity, uh, even within that context, LGBTQ communities were not included. Similarly, the LGBT Health Services Access Research wasn't looking at the home care uh, sector in terms of thinking about barriers to equitable care for queer communities. So for the research team, this exclusion and inattention constituted a social justice issue for LGBTQ communities. As a social, so as a social justice seeking endeavor, our project's goals emulated the ethical assumption of the transformative paradigm that emphasizes the pursuit of social justice and the furtherance of human rights through both the research process and outcomes. There's so much I could say, but I just don't have time. So I hope I'm pulling out examples that really get to the point. Uh, but maybe if I'm not, some of your questions might help with that. Uh, the transformative paradigm served as an ethical framework in which to locate the problematizing of the social and political context of inequitable health service distribution and the impacts of oppressive institutional practices on LGBTQ communities. So this is a political project. Uh, often I think some projects related to access to services are depoliticized through the paradigms in which they're conducted and the theories that inform them, but we conceptualize access as a very political uh, issue. Um, to address inequitable health services distribu distribution, we sought to expand the breadth and depth of knowledge about LGBTQ home care access that could inform policy and practice change that would enhance equal access to high quality home care. So quite uh, simply, we really didn't know much about uh, the experiences of LGBTQ people and home care um, you know, how are services being accessed, were they being accessed, by whom, and which services. So we identified a number of questions related both uh, to both measuring and exploring home care access for LGBTQ communities, questions that we felt, if answered, would contribute to the production of useful knowledge with respect to enhancing access to high quality home care for these communities. As you can see, some of our questions were quantitative in nature as they related to our interest in discovering broad, tr broad trends in home care use for LGBTQ community members. And other questions were qualitative in nature as they were related uh, to gaining understanding of the nature of home care access experiences for LGBTQ communities. So that is getting to the details and complexity of access from that critical intersectional perspective. Um, the qualitative piece was really about um, further exploring the concept of access. So in response to the two sets of questions and the intersectional framing of the project, we adopted a mixed methods, multi-armed approach to gain access to the perspectives of a range of home care stakeholders, including LGBTQ service users, 
uh, multidisciplinary service providers. Home care is a pretty complex land, uh, terrain, it's, um, and organizational administrators. Um, and by that I mean CCAC administrators, not contracted home care service provider organizations, which, which are different. Of course, mixed, method, uh, mixed methods is aligned with the transformative paradigm as the integration of quantitative and qualitative approaches have been noted by Mertens as serving to enhance understanding of injustice and perceived fairness. In adopting a mixed methods approach, we are very much aligned with existing literature that underscores the need to not focus on the incommensurability of paradigms most often represented by survey methods and narratives obtained through individual and focus group interviews. Rather, we appreciated mixed methods as a, as a distinct third methodological movement, having the potential to produce transformative knowledge through the use of both survey, survey data and narratives. So that is uh, to produce useful knowledge to respond to the social justice pers pursuit of the project. More specifically, um, it was our experience that the intentional integration of quantitative, this is where it gets good, bad, and ugly. Uh, <laughs> it was the experience uh, that the intentional integration of, the, of quantitative and qualitative data where the potential for mixed methods to produce useful knowledge lies. And this seemed particularly important in terms of our interest in understanding how intersections or intersecting identities produce different access experiences within uh, queer communities. So there are th uh, specific approaches to integrate quantitative and qualitative research procedures and data that can be implemented at the design, methods, and uh, interpretation and reporting levels of research. Um, and as somebody has said, we can think of these uh, various levels as where quantitative data and qualitative data meet, greet, and interact. And, and I'm going to uh, pull some examples from the project that uh, speak to each of the, each of the levels. <clears throat> so, that's not somebody whistling at me for a minute, but <laughs> Lori trying to get my attention maybe. Um, at the design level, we operationalized integration by adopting an explanatory sequential component to our multi-armed project. And this was respect to the LGBTQ service user and home care service provider arms. So for each arm, we, we began with a web-based survey that were, that, was wide, that were widely distributed to relevant listservs, organizations, community groups, and contacts across Ontario. And we co-created these surveys with our two advisory committees, and um, we piloted them using Think Aloud interviews uh, with, uh, sorry, just a service user uh, surveys we piloted using Think Aloud interviews with six community members. Uh, we began the distri distribution of the service user surveys in October 2012. We analyzed survey responses to inform questions for inclusion on the service user semi-structured interview guide. And then about a year later, we repeated the same process with the service provider survey. We could have started with the qualitative piece um, in, in terms of the project, but given the lack of... Um, uh, data that was available, given the lack of knowledge, information about LGBTQ communities and home care. Um, and really, when you think about the number of people that we were looking at, we were thinking about LGBTQ communities who are using home care, so fairly small numbers. Um, we thought we would be better off trying to go uh, reach far with uh, the quantitative survey. Um, Um, sorry about that. I think I skipped that too soon. So we analyzed survey responses to inform questions for inclusion on the service user semi-structured interview guide. I said this, and about a year later, we did the same process with the service provider arm. So for each arm, the semi-structured interview guide could be considered uh, as an extension of their respective surveys, and we use these for the purpose of collecting uh, qualitative data in an effort to explain uh, the quantitative data in more depth. At the methods section, or at the methods level, we used connecting and building to integrate quantitative and qualitative data. First, we connected data sets by recruiting the qualitative sample from the population of participants who completed each survey. This isn't, uh, I think, an uncommon practice. Um, so survey respondents from both of the surveys were asked at the end 
if they wanted to participate in an ind individual interview. Those who wanted to do that uh, provided contact information that was delinked from their survey responses. Um, and we delinked this for the purpose of ensuring their confidentiality. The flip side of that is that uh, we could not purposefully recruit participants for interviews and focus groups based on their survey responses and or demographic information. So that really was a limitation um, of, of this piece. Um, and a particular uh, importance, a limitation in terms of the intersectional an analysis um, and ensuring that participant interviews brought forth a broad range of experiences. There were, there were many times when we thought we would like to propulsively uh, uh, recruit or select uh, participants from the survey uh, sample, but we weren't able to do that. However, Connecting did facilitate the integration of collated quantitative and collated qualitative data towards the goal of developing a detailed and nuanced account of the range of home care service access experiences within queer communities. Second, we integrated the quanti quantitative and qualitative data sets through building. The linkage of data through building happened within and across uh, arms of the project. I have an example of within the project, but um, well, I'm worried about time from it so far. Okay, so within the service user arm of the project, uh, quantitative data based on a closed-ended question about the reasons why participants' home care services were stopped, informed an open-ended question on the LGBTQ semi-structured interview guide to explore this phenomenon in more detail. Um, and in particular, the open-ended question was important, was important in terms of an in-depth exploration of intersectional considerations related to access and socioeconomic status, discrimination, and other service termination experiences identified by LGBTQ service respondents. So in terms of the others, um, well, in terms of discrimination, um, the, this semi-structure, uh, or the, the question on the interview guide really helped us to understand better how race and sexual orientation intersected to result in the termination of, um, of home care services. Um, so we used the items from the survey as prompts uh, with the open-ended question on the interview guide. In terms of building across arms of the project, the service user and service provider quantitative and qualitative data sets were used to create interview questions for home care administrators that reflected access and equity concerns identified by service users and service providers. We used findings from the service user and service provider findings um, surveys to contextualize access and equity policy and practice questions asked of CCAC administrators. So for example, our service user finding of 40% of LGBTQ service user participants not knowing about home care prior to their use of services served as context to the question of whether and how Home care organizations have engaged LGBTQ communities at various levels of responsibilities. So, for example, inclusion of LGBT community members at the board of directors, it, um, at uh, senior management, uh, in program planning committees, these sorts of things. Um, and this was actually interesting because as we, we had a think tank with policymakers, and actually this 40% isn't uncommon. Uh, I think it's very similar to the general population. But um, what was useful about integrating data is that it raised uh, different uh, points of concern so that LGBTQ uh, participants didn't know about home care for different reasons than the general population. So, so again, getting into the sort of the nuanced experiences. So, oops. Um, Similarly, we developed an interview question for CCAC administrators about LGBTQ-specific training and education opportunities that exist for service providers. And this was based on a service provider uh, use, uh, survey finding that 90% had not had access to training and education while employed in home care. This was important also because in integrating the quantitative and qualitative findings, we were able to, again, 
understand better the nuances within the, the larger group of service providers so that in fact personal support workers as unregulated as an unregulated unreg profession in this urban context largely cons uh, constituted by uh, or uh, constituted by newcomer uh, racialized women were getting no access to training and education related to LGBTQ service provision. So when we think about the project as political and addressing equity and access, it wasn't just related to LGBTQ service users, but um, service providers as well. And I really think the mixed methods piece brought these, uh, these pieces forward. So drawing on quantitative findings from each arm toward the development of the semi-structured interview guide for home care administrators meant that we could more fully contextualize the access and equity experiences of LGBTQ service users and uh, care providers by including the perspectives of home care administrators stakeholders. So we were getting these multiple perspectives on this issue of access. Um, that is integrating quantitative and qualitative data through building strengthen the project's potential to produce useful knowledge by uncovering the organizational policies and practices or organizational dynamics that contribute to LGBTQ home care service experiences, um, those that were identified by service users themselves. <clears throat> Five minutes? Okay. So at the interpretation and reporting level, we integrated quantitative and qualitative data through narrative uh, using weaving, uh, weaving and contiguous uh, approaches. Um, and I'll speak to this a bit uh, in terms of um, a home care decision maker uh, think tank initiative that we conducted and the project's uh, KT materials. So through the weaving approach, we presented both quantitative and qualitative findings together on a theme-by-theme -theme basis. Uh, for example, during this think tank event where we had um, a number of ministry and home care uh, policy people present, we paired quantitative and qualitative findings within a subsample of trans participants. Findings about trans participants being less likely to access formal care services were woven with the narratives of trans participants on the impacts of not accessing formal care services. And we did this to convey to the uh, participants of the think tank um, a nuanced understanding of the consequences of inac inaccessible services. Um, and I think this sort of maybe gets to Janet's idea about revealing silences in the quantitative data. Um, so the narrative served to reveal the range of the informal home care experiences among the 41% of trans participants who described not using formal home care services. So the quantitative da uh, data was important in terms of understanding that 41% weren't using formal home care services, but it didn't actually tell us the story of how people were getting care. Uh, outside of the formal healthcare system. The narratives uncover the ways in which access to informal networks of care are shaped by the intersection between race and class. That is, they underscored particular implications of lack of access to both formal and informal care for trans people who are racialized, feel dis disenfranchised from trans resources, and or who may be socially isolated. In the project uh, report, we have a project report. We used a weaving approach to report on the key themes of worries about accessing formal home care services described by LGBTQ participants by drawing on both the quantitative and qualitative findings. So in this example, so in this, this is, uh, this was from the survey. Um, and they were, these were survey, survey items in terms of worries. Um, so in this example, the quantitative finding that 15% of participants described interactions with service providers during which their partners were not respected was nuanced by qualitative data that detailed lack of respect at the intersection between gender and age. So we see this uh, situation where a home care uh, provider is referring to some, uh, somebody's partner as her mother and then just sort of says, oh, I just use whatever is more common, which is strange. But anyway... Um, um, so in terms of weaving quantitative and qualitative data across stakeholder groups, quantitative findings that 90% of home care service providers have never received uh, LGBT-focused education and training while working in home care was woven with qualitative findings 
from LGBTQ service interviews so that we were able to show the implications of that lack of training for service users. Um, this provided think tank participants a rich understanding of the impact of lack of provider education. And of course, again, we're looking at intersections here where we have the intersection of race and uh, sexual orientation, um, both uh, speaking to provider lack of education. And finally, um, the integration of evidence. Oh, sorry. Oh, so this is actually, I'll maybe stop here because I think I'm running out of time, but um, one minute. So in our third knowledge translation document, we opted for a contiguous approach whereby we reported qualitative findings only, separating them from related quantitative findings. And this was an intentional use of um, LGBTQ service user narratives to queer a patient value document um, identified by a provincial home care association. So if you see in the black uh, font that the, this patient values document had a number of values and described them, and they described be, uh, to be respected as being treated in a manner that is courteous, considerate, and respectful of your dignity, privacy, and independence. And we use the service user uh, narratives to queer this so that it read being treated in a manner that is courteous, considerate, which means not being expected to educate your care provider about LGBT communities and cultures and specific health care needs, and respectful of your dignity and privacy, which means not being exposed to intrusive questions about your relationship, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. So we, this is the full document. So any of the purple font is uh, narratives that are mapped on. I have a, a, just one other example. This is just combining the quantitative and qualitative uh, data to produce an access and equity framework for home care. So we have six um, indicators of access, and we uh, brought in the quantitative and qualitative to support uh, a rationale for each of the indicators, and then also um, to identify um, items that would... This is where I'm not a quantitative researcher. Uh, well, the items that would support uh, the achievement of that indicator. Um, so this is, this is sort of the combination. So I guess I conclude by thinking about, you know, whether or not uh, we were able to use uh, practices of integration well enough, successfully enough, to enhance the uh, transformative uh, potential of the project. Um, our quantitative findings enhance the breadth of qualitative findings uh, uh, were useful in terms of gaining analytical depth, particularly in relation to um, intersectionality. Um, my sense is that integrating the quantitative and qualitative procedures really serve to address the complexity of the LGBTQ home care access experiences, bringing forth silences, uh, uh, silences in the quantitative work. Um, also, in some ways, making the qualitative narratives more accessible uh, through the through descriptive statistics, which uh, in you know when you only have ten minutes to present, that, that's very useful. Um, and I think overall uh, was very useful in terms of resisting homogenizing narratives about LGBTQ experiences. Um, and there's I, I think this idea of coherence, where the quantitative and qualitative data cohered in a way that. Um, produced a more robust um, uh, picture of what access in home care looks like for LGBTQ communities. So.